Good evening. Good to see everybody this evening. Glad you're here. We're continuing our study of uh, how to interpret the Bible. And tonight we come to uh, the inductive method which was used by Christ and his disciples. And you'll understand that more as we make our way along. Uh, Bobby, I think I got it to you by email, maybe, theoretically. <laughs> okay, so some people say we cannot understand the Bible alike. And usually their reasoning for that is something along this order. The Holy Spirit speaks to each person in a different way from the Bible. And so, in other words, what it says to you, it may not say to me, is their point that they're making. Uh, they also believe, though, that we're all on the path to heaven. We're just taking different routes to get there. Now, that's their thinking. It's not my thinking, but that's the way that they think about it. I will suggest to you uh, that, in point of fact, Scripture reveals that Jesus Christ and his apostles had a very different view of scriptural authority. They believed that you could go to scripture and find what you needed to determine what you ought to do. We're going to demonstrate that, Lord willing, as we go through. So I want to talk about the inductive method because that's the method they used. And to explain it, the inductive method is a leading or a drawing off of general fact from a number of observations and experiments. In other words, you really cannot take one verse and decide all about what's taught about in Scripture. You've got to take everything Scripture has to say about it. And we talk about this more as we go along. No interpretation is true that does not harmonize with known facts. The known facts have to agree, and we'll see that more in just a moment. We must be sure to gather as many parts as possible so we can clearly identify the whole. If you're putting together a puzzle, uh, you know, when you first look at it, it's just a jumble. You know? But as you begin to put the pieces together, you begin to see the image take shape. And that's effectively what you have with Scripture. Uh, for instance, we do not know everything that Jesus ever did or said, but we do have sufficient evidence to prove that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Look at what John says, John chapter 20, beginning verse 30, he said, Many of the signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. The inductive method actually involves a careful search for truth. Oh, that's the wrong one. It's my fault. Okay, no, you're not going to have a PowerPoint because Dum Dum sent the wrong one. And that would, I'm Dum Dum, not him. Okay, that's okay. My, my fault. Uh, I'm sending different things out today, other places, and I got the wrong one. Sorry. But I can give you these notes, uh, especially if you want them by text or email or something. We'll figure something out. Okay. So at any rate, harmony is one of the first demands of truth. Two truths never contradict. Very important to think about that. If you know the truth on a certain subject, that will not contradict another verse and some other, and I'm putting that in quotes, truth. It won't be a real truth. can't be because they always harmonize. In our courts, which use this inductive method, we all want the evidence carefully sought out and presented. Uh, we do not want a doctor to operate on, uh, based upon one inconclusive test. We talked a little bit, bit about that last week. Our souls are at stake. According to John 8, 32, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We do not want our understanding of doctrine to be based on only a few verses read without proper consideration of other facts. Don't, don't let somebody take you to one verse and say, see here, this verse teaches this. Well, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. And we're going to learn more about that as we go along. But really, you have to take 
all that Scripture says to really understand. Uh, inference actually is a valid thing to be used in association with interpreting the Bible. Let me see if I can explain that. It can be inferred that Lot went down to Egypt. How are you going to do that? Well, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 10, it says Abram went down into Egypt. But in Genesis chapter 13, verse 1, it says Lot came up out of Egypt. Well, we know Lot and Abram were often together, and from the fact that he came up, we know he went down. And I'm, I would suggest that possibly he went, but likely, in fact, went with Abram or Abraham as we know him. The purpose of the book of Acts can be inferred from its content. Uh, Clinton Lockhart, in his book, Principles of Interpretation, said it this way, it is a necessary inference that the writer, he's talking about of Acts, aimed to inform the reader accurately of the beginnings of Christianity and of the divine directions by which men turn to the Lord and form churches. And you infer that from just reading the book. Get the contents, and it will point you in that direction. But now, for the rest of the time, we really want to zero in on the, the general use of the inductive method and demonstrate that it was done by the Lord and by his disciples in various circumstances. So, for instance, Christ used the inductive method on the road to Emmaus. Everybody turn to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, you may remember that Jesus has been raised from the dead. Uh, Jesus, uh, unknown to this, these two fellows, he joins them and, and begins to walk with them toward Emmaus. I say unknown to them. The point being, they don't know who it is. They just, they just know they're walking with a certain fella. And as they're walking along, they're talking about the resurrection or at least the possibility of it. Some of the women say, you know, but, but uh, you know, we don't know. We don't know what's going on. And finally, Jesus... Uh, again, still not known to them, Jesus says, what are you talking about? And if we were putting this in our terms, you can almost hear them answer. They say, where have you been living? Under a rock? <laughs> you don't know what's been going on in Jerusalem? And uh, then he, they begin to elaborate uh, certain parts of that, uh, particularly uh, if you go back to... Uh, <clears throat> Verse 20 of Luke 24, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body... They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. By the way, who are the certain ones that went to the tomb? Peter and John. Now, uh, you have to kind of read all of uh, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and the book of John to figure out it's John. <laughs> uh, Peter is clearly stated you know, within the text, but not, uh, not so with John. He's usually described as the, uh, the disciple Jesus loved, usually the way he is described. So, listen to how Jesus begins to answer, because this is the inductive method encapsulated in a very quick statement of his. Then he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now here's my question. Could you begin with Genesis and go through the book of Malachi 
and demonstrate to me what God said Jesus was going to do. Is that possible to do that? It actually is. There's a, there's a book, an excellent book, by the way. If you do not have it, you might consider, and I don't make any money for recommending books. Uh, I lose money because I give away books sometimes, but I don't make any money. But uh, if you look at a book uh, that's called Portrait of God, uh, that book traces the picture of Jesus going from Genesis all the way through Malachi. Uh, demonstrating what, what went on. That's what Jesus did here. And what is that? That's the inductive method. He starts at Genesis and goes all the way through. What did he include? Well, the text doesn't tell us. I can tell you what my best guess is. That he started with Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. That he went on to Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 15, and Genesis chapter 22. And that he continued right on, uh, for example, the book of Isaiah uh, that we'll look at on other occasions likely would have been included. And the prophecy of Moses about a prophet like unto him that's going to be raised up from the book of Deuteronomy. I would assume all of that would be included. He instructed them on everything that the scripture had to say uh, in regard to that. Well, their eyes, of course, you'll remember, were opened up when he said a prayer and they were breaking bread. That's when they realized who he was. Maybe it's the uniqueness of his prayer. Maybe it's God just, so to speak, removing a curtain. I don't know. I just know they now recognize him, and then he disappears. And what do they do? Well, I, I've always wondered, why did they go to Emmaus? Because I can tell you what they didn't do. They didn't complete whatever the task was. They rushed back to the city, and they told the disciples, Hey, we've seen the Lord. And uh, that, that message is delivered to them again in Luke chapter 24. And then Jesus comes. Look at verse 36. Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. Now, I've got to tell you, I, if I put John chapter 20 together correctly, I believe this is the, the first time Jesus appeared to them and not the second. Because in the second, there's only one that hears, see my hands, see my feet, see my side, and that's Thomas. That's the second one. That, that's, that's the way I piece all this together as I'm reading Scripture. And by the way, that's inductive, isn't it? I'm putting all the pieces together to try to understand better. And so, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe, isn't that interesting, for joy and marvel, he said to them, have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Now watch. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. Where did he go to do that? Law of Moses, prophets, and the Psalms. That, by the way, pretty much comes to the whole Old Testament. Uh, might he have brought up Psalm 22? I, my best guess is he did. Because Psalm 22 talks about the events around the cross, and can you almost not see the, the faces of the, of the disciples as their, their eyes just light up with recognition? We saw all that stuff. We've been reading that passage all of our lives. We've heard it over and over again, and lo and behold, that's about you. We get it now. You know, well, that appears to be. Now, on the basis of that inductive method, 
He then goes on to say, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Now, if you look at this passage, you might want to put a mark, and maybe it's in the, the footnotes of your Bible or a center column reference. You might want to put 1 Corinthians 15, because what Luke's uh, writing here sounds a whole lot like what Paul said and wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Didn't he say uh, that he preached the gospel unto them, that how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and he's buried and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Do you see the inductive method? Do you see how it's working? Don't let the wording scare you. Uh, you know, the inductive method is very, very common uh, in, in our society. We use it all the time. Uh, Dustin could tell us all about it in a court of law. <laughs> That's exactly how they come to conclusions. Is they put together all the facts and come up with a conclusion, you know, based on what they've done. That's what we're trying to do as we look at, at, these, at these verses. All right, now let's go on to Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, we're going to, uh, to see the, the method used again. Um, Jesus has now ascended to heaven. That's in the early part of the chapter. And in verse 15, we find, And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120. And said, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. Now watch him. He's going to quote the primary two passages in regard to the, what Judas did and what needs to be done now from the Old Testament. He's going to use the inductive method. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his entrails uh, gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem so that the field is called in their own language a keldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it. Okay, where's his dwelling place? That's his, where his tomb is. Who's going to live there? Nobody. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a field for corpses. That's it. That's all that's going to be there. And then, and let another take his office. Now watch Peter as he reasons out of that. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us from the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they propose two, and you remember, they go on and select Matthias. But notice he uses the inductive method. Two passages in the Old Testament, both of which deal with Judas, and he draws conclusions from that and decides what they need to do. Now, I grant you he's inspired. I get that. But we can do this same type of thing it just takes a little more work for us than it did, might have for him. All right, so that's Acts 1. Now, what about Acts chapter 2? Acts chapter 2 is Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. And again, he used the inductive method in order to deliver his message that day. How does it, how does it begin? Well, you remember... There was a sound, now watch it, as of a rushing mighty wind. Was it a mighty wind? No, it was a sound as of a rushing mighty wind. I'm going to give you a kind of an odd comparison. It's not the same thing by any means, but everybody I've ever heard talk about a tornado uh, coming down on them says it sounds like a train. That's what they, it sounds like that. So that's what's going on here. It sounds like a rushing mighty wind. Now, do you marvel at the, the idea that then people will come together when they hear that sound? They're looking for, where's the sound coming from? What's this all about? 
They're probably also looking to see what got torn up. Because around here, well, you go over close to where Mr. Wayne Morris lives, and in that spring of bad straight wind storm that we had, about every other house had a tree through the, slapped through the middle of it, just about. And so they, they may have been looking for the damage. They didn't find any. Instead, what did they find? They found these men, and they could look at them and see, these are not educated men. These aren't Jewish leaders. These aren't rabbis. Uh, for the most part, these fellows are fishermen. They're common working men, a tax collector. What do they know about Scripture? Probably not much. And what do they know about foreign languages? Probably nothing. They don't know the whole truth about it. And yet, every individual in that audience heard them speak in the language in which he was born. What are tongues then? Tongues are languages. Uh, some years ago, uh, Brother William Woodson was in a series in Jamestown, New York. And a fellow came in. Brother Woodson had been delivering lessons. And he'd, he'd gone into the office of the preacher to, to kind of get freshened up and ready for the next lesson he's going to deliver. And a fellow came to the preacher and said, I, I, I want to talk to Brother Woodson. He said, well, uh, he said, I speak in tongues. Well, Brother Woodson been talking about some of those matters. And, and he said, well, okay, let me just take you to Brother Woodson because the preacher didn't know how to answer him uh, at that point. And he went into Brother Woodson and he said, uh, he said, Brother Woodson, I speak in tongues. And he said, which one, German or French? Well, good question. Uh, because the scripture lets us know that they were speaking in the language in which people were born. Now, for us, that would be, well, I don't know if we'd say English or Southern. It's one or the other. Uh, but, uh, but for other people, it'd be, you know, it might be French, German, Spanish, whatever the case may be. So what does Peter do with that? Well, he immediately goes to the prophet Joel. And he, he deals with the number one passage that anticipates this day coming. It's Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. And he uses that because at the very end of it, it says, It shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And brethren, why do we not circle that and then draw a line over to, men and brethren, what shall we do? Because, because Peter says that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. They want to know what we've got to do, and Peter does what? He tells them how to call on the name of the Lord. Impenitent baptism. You say, oh, I don't know about that. Better check your know, inductive method, remember? You better check Acts chapter 22, verse 16, where Ananias comes to Paul, or Saul at that time, and he's supposed to tell him what he must do to be saved. And what he said, what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized. Wash away thy sins calling on the name of the Lord. How do you call on the name of the Lord? In baptism. That's how you do it. But you learn that by the inductive method, by putting these pieces together, you see. So Peter begins with Joel. Then what does he do? Well, he then begins to, to speak to them and say, Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you, by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by lawless hands have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible <coughs> that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, wait a minute, David, yeah, we're getting ready to use the inductive method again. And what does he quote here? He's going to quote from Psalm 16, and verses 8 through 11. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. 
you will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he's both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. What's he doing? That's inference. Was David talking about himself? No. How do you know? Because his tomb's right over there, and it's still full. There's still bones in it. That's inference, brethren, and we need to see it so that we're able to understand Scripture clearly. That's what he's doing here. So who was David talking about? Wasn't talking about himself. Who's he talking about? Well, Peter goes ahead, doesn't he? And he says, therefore, being a prophet. By the way, where did he write that? He wrote that in the Psalms. Can you call the Psalms a prophecy? The answer to that is yes. They are prophetic. So go ahead. Uh, therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Now, you need a little background there. We're going to talk more about background in a few weeks, if the Lord wills. Uh, the background is that they did not believe the body began to corrupt until the fourth day. How long was Jesus in the tomb? Three days. See, that's how long. So did his body see corruption? Not by Jewish way of thinking, it did not. And that's, that's what's critical to their understanding at this point. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God... And have received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit in my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Now, wait a minute. Where'd that come from? That's Psalm 110. Uh, by the way, my recollection is the writer of Hebrews quotes the same verse. And he used it to apply to to Jesus too. So are, we're watching the inductive method unfold. When they got up to preach, they referenced the Word of God. Now, brethren, let me offer you this point, and I'm, I'm very, very strong and serious about this. Quit telling people, I believe this, I believe that. That's an invalid argument. It won't work. If you want to tell them what you believe, say, well, the Scripture says, and go to it. And they're going to catch on. After a while, they're going to say, you know, you're kind of different. Every time you answer a question, you quote Scripture. And you might say, well, I don't know a Scripture for what they're talking about. Well, then just tell them, you know what? I want to talk to you more about that later. I'm going to go home and do some homework. I'm going to study. we got to be a people of the book. That's what they were in the first century. It's what made the church grow. If we want the church to grow at Siwa Road, we've got to become a people of the book. That's got to be our answer, the inductive method, in other words. All right. Next, I want to go to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7 is the sermon of Stephen. Uh, I really don't know if Stephen finished his sermon or not. I know he got interrupted for sure. Uh, maybe he was through. Maybe he was not. Maybe he'd driven his point home. Possibly. Maybe he had not. But what did he use to talk to them, that is the Jews of his era, about? He used the inductive method. Start with Abraham. And I'm going to read, I'm going to read what's in Acts. And I'm giving you the references in in. Uh, my notes, I'll refer to them. I won't, we're not going to read all of them. But I'm going to demonstrate that everything he stated is found in mostly in the book of Genesis. He's talking about Abraham. It's, about, it's in the book of Genesis. So, he starts. And he said, verse 2, chapter 7, Brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. Okay. Question, book of Genesis, where did Abraham live before he lived in Haran? 
Ur, Ur of the Chaldees. Now we know something that you don't, you don't absolutely know in Genesis. And that is that God came to him the first time in Ur. He will come to him again. All right, if you want to see a reference, it seems to me to that. It's when he says, get out of your father's house, get away from it. I think that's Genesis chapter 11, verses 31, 32. All right, go ahead, read verse 3. And he said to him, get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. And uh, that looks like that's the second call that's in Haran. And that is found in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now look at verse 4. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. All right, he moved to Canaan. Where is that found? Genesis chapter 12, verses 5 through 7. You see how you, this is inductive the whole way. It's just going boom, 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 coming right down the text uh, in the book of Genesis as he tells this story. By the way, where is Mesopotamia? What does that mean? Land between the rivers. That's what it means. Uh, not land between the lakes. That's in Kentucky, okay? But land between the rivers, Mesopotamia. And if you were to make a drawing, and I don't even have a board up here, and if I did, you probably wouldn't recognize the drawing anyway. Uh, but if, if you were to make a drawing, you go over to the east, and you've got, you've got two arms coming out off, off of one branch. And the, the, the top arm is the Tigris, and the lower arm is the Euphrates, and Ur is right down in the middle of them, almost where the two join, almost. Now, when he goes to Haran, he goes up Mesopotamia, stays in Mesopotamia. He's still between the rivers, but he's up toward the northern edge, getting ready to go out of it. When God tells him to go again, he comes out of Mesopotamia, and comes down the coast to the land that we call, at this point in time, the land of Canaan. And that's what Stephen has just said as he's, as he's opening up this story uh, for us. All right, look at verse 5. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. So in other words, we've got a promised land and a promised son. That's Genesis 12:7, 13, 15, 15, 4, 15, 18, 17, 8, and 26, 3. He he's got a lot of verses in one quick statement. Uh, but he they know he's talking to people that had studied uh, these passages. So then he goes on, 6 and 7, and he says, But God spoke in this way, that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage I will judge, said God, and after that they shall come out and serve me in this place. What land's he talking about? Egypt. Egypt. That's exactly what he's talking about. How'd they get there? God got them there through Joseph. That's how he got them there. And so there's, an, there's a, a way in which this text is alluding even to Joseph to some extent as he's going through this, this story. All right, pick up verse 8. Then he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. Isaac begot Jacob and Jacob begot the twelve patriarchs. Question, did Moses, excuse me, did Abraham live under the law of Moses when he was circumcised? No. Okay, very important to see that. So the promise made to Abraham does not depend on the law of Moses. You've got a lot of religious neighbors that are going to try to tell you you've got to know the law of Moses to go to heaven. Don't tell Abraham that. He didn't know it. It didn't work out that way. And that's what, that's what Stephen's doing now. He's coming down through here telling this story in just that way so that we understand it. By the way, 
That reference you can find in Genesis 17, 9 through 14, and also Genesis 21, uh, verses 1 through 5. All right, then he goes ahead. Pick up at verse 9 of Acts 7. And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now that, uh, that little uh, two-verse set there covers basically uh, from Genesis chapter 37 to Genesis chapter 45 or thereabouts. He's covered all that in one quick statement. Is it the inductive method? Yes, he's using the inductive method, coming right down the story, telling them exactly how that it is. So what, what does he talk about? Well, God was with him. Where was he with him? In Potiphar's house, in the prison. He was with him in the interpretation of the dreams. He was with him when he interpreted even Pharaoh's dreams. Joseph was, in, was governor in Egypt because of the wisdom God gave him. And that's what Stephen argues here. As governor, he met his brothers. Listen to that, verse 11. Now a famine and a great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And the second time, Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent and called his father Jacob and all his relatives to him, 75 people. So Jacob went down to Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. But again, Going right down the line, quickly, uh, you've got the revelation of his brothers and, and, and of course, his father. That's Genesis 41, uh, verse 46, all the way through Genesis 47, verse 12. Both Jacob and his sons were buried in Canaan. We know that about Jacob for sure in Genesis chapter 47, verse 13. And really, you can track on down to Genesis 50, last chapter of the book. Verse 14. So then what does he do? He next goes in verse 17 and starts talking about another fellow. Listen to him. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose who did not know Joseph. Does this sound familiar? He's just going right down through the book of, of Exodus now. Now let me ask you a question. What conclusion... Could you draw already, if you've been, if you're really paying close attention to what he's saying, here's the conclusion. Every time God gives them a leader, they're going to reject him. They rejected Joseph. They're going to reject Moses. Every time. Later, he's going to say, you've done the same thing to the prophets and even to the, to the Holy One, to Christ. And that's when they blow a cork. <laughs> if you want to know the whole truth about it. That's when they rush on him and, and uh, gnash at him with their teeth. You can almost hear them grinding their teeth at him. They're so mad at him. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, windows of heaven are open, he, uh, and we get a real mess. They stone him to death. This is the way that goes. All right. I kind of sped that up because I want, I want us to see not just that Stephen does it. Now I want us to go to the book of Acts chapter 15. In Acts chapter 15, we have a new incident. There's a problem in the church. Let's all look together and see what the problem was uh, before we go any further. Now, Acts chapter 15, begin at verse 1. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised, According to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. Now, where, where were they? They're in Antioch on the Orontes, not Antioch of Pisidia, 
Antioch of the Orontes. That's basically Paul's home base. That's where he'll go at the end of every uh, missionary tour until they take him captive and haul him off to Rome. And in that case, he doesn't go back, you know. But all the other times, he does. So what are they going to do? They go to Jerusalem to answer the question. And when they come to Jerusalem, they're received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported uh, all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Okay, what's the main discussion here? Do you or do you not have to be circumcised to go to heaven? And we're talking about physically circumcised. If you're talking about spiritually, the answer is yes. If you're talking about physically, the answer is no. <laughs> and that's what they're talking about right here is physical circumcision. So now let's begin to see how they did what they did because they used the inductive method. This is like a court hearing that goes on next. Now watch. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up. Here's first witness. Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But... We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we should be saved in the same manner as they. What did the first witness say? Don't have to be circumcised to go to heaven. That's the first witness. Next witness. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul. So witness number two and witness number three, Barnabas and Paul. And what do they say? Declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. Does God accept the Gentiles without circumcision? Paul and Barnabas would say, absolutely they, he does. We've seen it with our own hands and our own eyes. And that's their testimony. That's witness number two and witness number three. Now, watch, because here comes witness number four. And witness number four is most interesting. It's not a man. Yes, I know a man stands up to speak, but the witness is not a man. So listen, listen closely. Uh, and after they had become silent, James answered saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with the, the, this the words of the prophets agree just as it is written, after this, I'll return and I'll rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I'll rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things. Who is the fourth witness or what is the fourth witness? Well, if you want to say it's Amos, you can do that. Uh, although he's dead, he's quoted. So Scripture is the fourth witness. They, he quotes from Amos chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. All right, so what evidence do we have? Peter says God accepts the Gentiles. Paul says God accepts the Gentiles. Barnabas said God says, accepts the Gentiles. And the prophets say... God accepts the Gentiles. What's your conclusion? Well, obviously they have to be physically circumcised. No, no. Not a bit of it. It's not true. Not there. So listen as, as we go forward. Known to God from eternity are all his works. In other words, God knew from the very beginning he was going to put the Gentiles in the church. Though they'd have to obey the gospel just like anybody else. 
to be part of the church, but they don't have to be circumcised in order to be part of the church. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. By the way, where does that come from? Well, it's not law. It is in the law of Moses, but that law is stated initially to Noah in Genesis chapter 9, verse 4. We cannot eat blood. And that law is for all God's people, ever. We can't eat blood. So what do they do when they kill a deer? Don't they bleed him out? That's what you're supposed to do. I assume you do it that way. Uh, I wouldn't know. I never killed a deer. Killed a lot of ducks and a lot of dove and rabbits and squirrels, but never killed one deer in my time. Uh, not that I didn't try, but either I was a bad shot or else, or else I had a bad sight on the gun. Take your pick. I suspect you're going to pick the bad, the bad shooter, not the sight. But that's okay, you know, whatever. So we are not supposed to eat blood. That comes from predates the law of Moses. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. And so what do we have? We got very plainly the Gentiles do not have to be circumcised to go to heaven. How do we get there? Inductive method. Thank you very much. 